Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the seventh of a nine-part series on understanding how to parse JSON using the Quotable Protocol in Swift and Swift UI. In this video, we'll see how we can create a URL request that will query an external API, then decode the data response. We'll build on the initial example and create a generic function that we can reuse for API requests from other APIs. If this is something you want to learn, keep watching. So what is an API? API is an acronym for Application Programming Interface, which is a software intermediary that allows two applications to talk to each other. Each time you use an app like Facebook, send an instant message, or check the weather on your phone, you're using an API. Your application essentially sends a GET request to a server, and it responds back with an answer. The answer is in the form of an HTTP request and we're only interested in asking questions of a service that can talk JSON. There are many, many public APIs, and some require a token that you include in your request. To keep it simple, we're going to take a look at two simple APIs that don't. The first is GitHub. And for the purposes of this demo, I want to take a look at the documentation for their API that will allow us to find the list of followers for a specific account. For that, we can visit this page, and I'll leave a link in the notes below. When we're here, we can go to the Users Followers section. The base URL for all GET requests for the GitHub API is https colon slash slash api.github.com followed by slash users followed by the username followed by the type of request, and I'm going to choose Followers. Now I'm going to try and get the list of followers for Paul Hudson, who goes by the user ID 2straws. This will be the URL that I'll have to use. If I enter this URL into a browser, we see the results displayed in a window. All nicely laid out. No need for a JSON formatter. I should be able to build a structure from this. It's a flat object, nothing is nested, and all I'm interested in is the login and ID. So let's create our struct, and we'll call it GH follower, making sure that it conforms to decodable protocol. We have login, that's a string, and ID, that's an int. Let's create a function, and then we can call that function to retrieve our followers. We'll call the function getJSON, and there are some inherent problems with this that we'll fix by the end of the session, but it's a good place to start. First, let's validate our URL with a guard statement, and if it fails, we'll exit the function. Guard let URL equals URL, and the string is the get request URL, and that fails, we'll return. And next, we're going to wrap this URL in a URL request. With our URL request defined, we create and start a networking task with it. Now inside that URL request, we can check if there is an error, and if so, print it out and return the function doing nothing. We don't really need to check the response code because we don't want to do anything with it. But if there is no error, we pass on to check if there is data or not, and return from the function once more if there isn't. So if there is no error, and we do have data, we can proceed to code just as we always have done. We set up our decoder and then check if our response is valid or else we return. Notice that this time we are getting data in our completion block so we don't have to do any string conversion. We'll use the optional try to decode our data into an array of GH follower. If it fails, we'll just return. Now if we made it this far, we must have retrieved our array of followers. Bear with me here, I'm going to go an extra step and say let followers equal decoded data, and then loop through and print out each login for each follower. This will hopefully make sense in just a minute. Of course, in order for our data task to execute, we need to add dot resume. And now finally, we can call getJSON. We'll run this playground, 
and it works. But our function is pretty specific to this particular API. Plus, since the network request may take a few seconds, we have to wait until it's finished before we can step through the followers. It is also running in the background thread, so any updates to the UI based on the results would have to be made in the background thread. I also don't like the fact that I'm dealing with the results right here in this function's code block. Let's switch this up a bit in an effort to clean up the code. I'll just copy first and comment out the old code and paste it in here. The first thing I'm going to do is take out that hard-coded URL string and pass it in with my function so that I can reuse it to find different users followed. Next, I don't like having to deal with the results in this function because I may have this function in a services file and have to update some variables in a wide number of views or controllers. It makes more sense to use a callback that gets called when the function network task is complete. So, in the function signature, we could add a completion callback that will take an optional array of gh follower and return void. What we're saying here is that after our data task has completed, we want to run a function using the array of followers if we were successful in decoding our data. That function is going to be passed at the time we call our function, but executed only after the task has completed. Now in the three cases where I return from the function, I can call the completion block prior to returning. In the case where there is an error and the error does not exist, I'll have our completion use nil as the array of gh followers. That's why we made the array optional, because our task might fail. This gives me an error that the escaping closure captures non-escaping parameter completion. To fix this, just add add escaping in front of your closure in your signature. If there is no data, my completion block will contain nil for the array of gh follower, and the same thing goes if the decoder can't decode our data. Now having passed all of these checks, we now must have made it to here with our decoded data, so we're going to use it as the parameter for our completion block. Let's remove these lines and pass decoded data as the parameter in our completion block. When I create the call to my getJSON now, I need to add the URL string for the two draws followers, and we can see that we have a trailing closure that is our completion block. This means that we will either receive an array of gh follower or nil as the closure parameter. So we can double click on the completion block and replace the placeholder with followers to represent our optional array. This is great. I can call this function from anywhere in my app and deal with the returned array whenever it's returned via the completion block. We can check to see if followers is nil with this if let block and if not, we can run a loop on each follower in the followers and print out the login. Running the code, we get our successful result displayed. This is better, but not good enough. What if we pass in a string to a different API that doesn't return an array of GitHub followers? Without getting into a discussion of generics, it's easy to refactor this function to use a generic type so I can use this function for all sorts of APIs. Let me copy this once more and comment it out and paste it down here. I want to make this function generic, meaning that I want to be able to have my completion return any type of object, as long as I'm consistent. We can start by specifying a placeholder type for our function, and the only requirement for this type is that it must be decodable. This means that it can be any object or array of objects where the objects are decodable. With that in place, we can replace the array of gh follower with our placeholder t. I'm going to replace both instances of the array of gh follower with our generic placeholder in the completion closer and in the decoder. Notice I don't use array of t, but rather just t. This will allow us to use the function when the JSON is an object or an array of objects. In our call to the function, we get an error because the generic parameter can't be inferred. And that's because our closure, which uses this generic type, doesn't know what it is. But we do. Followers is an optional array of gh follower. We can run the code, and all is good. 
Let's confirm that this works by looking at a completely different API. If you go to the Apple iTunes API document page, and I'll leave a link in the notes below, I can scroll down and see an example that searches for the first 25 iTunes songs for Jack Johnson. If I paste this into the browser, it doesn't display in the browser, but rather downloads as a text file. That's okay. Opening it up displays JSON, but it's not too pretty. Let's use our JSON formatter so that we should be able to build a struct, as we have some practice with that already. Well, I've already done that for you. If you check the sources folder, I've created a public struct called iTunes search, and I've made it decodable. The top level of the JSON has two keys, result count and results. And the results is an array of objects. I'm only interested in some of these, so inside the iTunes search struct that I created, I've ignored the count, but want the results, which is an array of my result struct. Okay, let's see if our generic JSON function can work. I'm going to try getting 25 of the Beatles songs. This means my URL will be this. Remember, our results that we get back isn't an array, it's actually an object of iTunes search of which there is a property called results that's an array. So when we use the getJSON function, we'll pass in the search URL for the 25 Beatles songs, and our search results that we get back will just be the optional iTunes search object. We check to see that it's not nil with the if let block, and then step through the search results array, printing out the track name. And since the track name itself is an optional parameter, we can use the nil coalescer to prevent the print from printing out the word optional. Great, we have a multi-purpose getJSON function. Just some final comments regarding this generic function. We assume that the APIs we're dealing with do not require any key or date coding strategies. I'll leave it up to you to add more parameters to pass into the getJSON function to make it even more usable in the case that you need to specify a particular date format or key coding strategy. I hope you've enjoyed this video and have learned something. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. That will encourage me to keep on creating more like this in an effort to help new and existing iOS developers hone their skills and move on to the next level. I am most active on Twitter, so be sure to follow me there and get all the latest news of what I'm up to.